We are very privileged and pleased to have this nationally recognized scholar in Kentucky. He's doing a foresight lecture series for the Family Foundation. We've done two in Lexington. We're doing this one here in Louisville, and then we're off to Princeton tonight. Um, his message, I believe, and as you can imagine my call, is critically important for the body of Christ in America and in Kentucky, because I believe Kentucky can have a leading role in America. Dr. Grudem is the research professor of theology and biblical studies at Phoenix Seminary in Phoenix, Arizona. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University, a Master of Divinity and a Doctor of Divinity from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, and a PhD in New Testament from the University of Cambridge in England. He has published 20 books, including his newest, Politics According to the Bible, which was first published in the fall of 2010. He was also the, gen the general editor for the 2.1 million word ESV study Bible, which became the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association Book of the Year and World Magazine's Book of the Year. He is a past president of the Evangelical Theological Society, a co-founder and past president of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womenhood, and a member of the uh, Translation Oversight Committee for the English Standard Version of the Bible. He and his wife, Margaret, have been married since 1969 and have three adult sons. His topic today is why Christians should influence government for good. Please give him a warm Kentucky welcome on a cold day. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Kent, very much. It's good to be here. I am so thankful for the work of Kentucky Family Foundation. Thank you, Professor Herschel York, for being our host here at Southern Seminary today. A little commercial. Um, Russ Moore has me scheduled to teach a course on the doctrine of the Word of God, which I think will get credit for a core theology course here at Southern Seminary. That'll be sometime this summer. I think it's in July. I don't know. But that's a little advertisement if you're interested. I'll, I'll, I'll be back. Um, Kent, where's Kent? Oh, he stepped out. Oh, I'm not going to say anything about him then. Thank you, Kent Ostrander. And jo oh, do you mind if I tell how the, the role I played in your? Okay, Kent Ostrander and his wife Joyce, who is here at the book table, um, have been married two years. They both tragically lost spouses to cancer uh, a few years before. And um, what I found out yesterday is that the reason Kent first was interested in Joyce's profile on eHarmony and contacted her was, she said, forgive the advertisement here, she said her favorite book was Grudem's Systematic Theology. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought that was good enough for him. And now they're married. So, well, when I found that out yesterday, I was just, what could I say? <laughs> good, it's good to be here with you. Um, I've been on this campus a lot of times, and I think uh, so highly of Southern Seminary and the work you're doing. You may have heard that, uh, as Kent said in the introduction, I graduated from Westminster Seminary, which is populated by numerous Presbyterians. But I want to assure you, Baptists in the room, that I went into Westminster Seminary as a Baptist, and I came out as a Baptist, unscathed, <laughs> with a few scars. I also want to introduce Jeff Phillips. Jeff's way in the back. Jeff is my uh, assistant this year, my ministry assistant. He's here doing the driving for me. So we're going several places in Kentucky in a short period of time. Jeff is uh, about to graduate from Phoenix Seminary in Arizona. He's a high honors graduate of the seminary. He's also had like 14 years of pastoral experience, including planting several churches. He's done a lot of evangelism, and, he's a, and he needs a job. So any pastors here are interested in an associate, I have to tell you, this will help some of you. He's a, an educated charismatic and uh, balanced and wise. And for some of you, you just scratched him off your list. And for others, this is, makes him more interesting. So uh, that's up to you. But I'm just thankful to have Jeff travel with me. He's gone with me to several states, and it's a joy to be here with him. As Kent said, oh, I'm, I'm going to be talking, I'm basically going to be summarizing the first two chapters of this book, Politics According to the Bible, it, uh, it covers about 60 specific political issues, which I won't be getting into. It's more introductory material today. But they're here on the table. I'll sign as many of them I can before we have to leave. And um, they're retail $40. They're here for $20. No tax, no shipping. 
and uh, you can't get them cheaper, so it's a bargain for today only, if you're interested. Okay, so here is the topic today. Why should Christians influence government for good? Oh, I didn't say hi to Bruce Ware. My longtime friend, Bruce, is over here, professor here at uh, Southern Seminary in Systematic Theology, and Bruce and I taught together at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for many years. He's a close friend, lifelong friend and colleague, so Bruce, thanks for coming. I'm going to start again. Why should Christians influence laws and politics and government for good? Before I give the reasons, I want to mention five mistakes that people have made in the past about religious influence on secular governments. So, here we go, five mistakes. One, the first wrong view is government should compel religion. Government should compel religion, force people to follow a certain religion. Unfortunately, this was the view held by many Christians in the 16th and 17th century. It led to the wars of religion in Europe where you had Catholic armies and Protestant armies fighting battles against each other. And if the Catholics won that territory, it was Catholic. And if the Protestants won that territory, it was Protestant. Because they had the view that the government could force a certain religious adherence uh, or loyalty on its people. Eventually, eventually, basically all leading Christians and rep leading leaders of the Christian church around the world came to repudiate that view because eventually they came to realize that it's inconsistent with the nature of genuine faith. The reason why government should not compel religion is that genuine faith cannot be forced. It can't be compelled. If you have raised children, you know that. You can bring your children to church, you can teach them the Bible, but the decision to trust in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that's something they have to decide for themselves. And if parents can't even force their own children to become genuine Christians, then surely it's futile to think that government could ever force anyone to be a believer. This view, unfortunately, this compel religion view, is still held by many Muslim countries throughout the world. We could not have a meeting like this in Saudi Arabia today if we began to advertise a meeting that said, why Christians should influence the government of Saudi Arabia for good. Well, you wouldn't get the poster up for more than a minute before you'd be arrested and thrown in jail. Because they still have the view that government should enforce religion, and in that case, it's Islam, and enforce compliance on everybody. But that's contrary to the nature of the Christian gospel. The gospel is an invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation to believe. Now, when I say that, sometimes people will object. But, Wayne, I've seen in the Old Testament where there were laws punishing people who advocated the serving of other gods. Didn't they enforce religion in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? Yes, they did. But the problem is, that was for that nation at that time. And when we get to the New Testament, we find out that that is no longer what the civil government is supposed to do. We find it for a couple of reasons. We find it first in the encounter that Jesus had with the Pharisees in Matthew 22, where they came and said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He said, show me the coin for the tax. And they gave him a denarius. And he said, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, therefore render to Caesar what is Caesar's. This has Caesar's inscription. This is Caesar's. Therefore it's lawful to pay the tax. Therefore render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God, what is God's? Historians of thought look back and say that was a history-changing distinction. Jesus didn't specify all the things that belonged in the realm that Caesar rightfully controlled and the realm that he didn't control or shouldn't control. But by setting out two realms, by setting out a Caesar-God distinction of realms of authority, he changed the history of thought so that we do not any longer have in the Christian world today all of religion under the control of a civil government. Muslims don't have any Caesar-God distinction. It's all under the control of the imam, whether you're in Iran or Saudi Arabia or some other Muslim country. But Christians realize there are some things 
some things that belong to Caesar, and Caesar can rightfully control. But there's another realm where Caesar should keep hands off because he doesn't have rightful authority over the things that belong to God. Now, I know some of you seminary students here will say, well, wait a minute, everything belongs to God. I understand that. But that's another sense of everything belongs to God. And in this distinction that Jesus is making, he's saying there are two realms. And of course, it's up to us then to decide with wisdom and the teaching of the rest of Scripture uh, what belongs in those two realms. But there are two realms.